Good afternoon to everyone joining us uh, in the Gulf region. Good morning to those in Europe. Welcome to uh, GTR MENA 2021 virtual uh, and to uh, this session uh, where we are looking at uh, new approaches to risk in the financing of trade. Uh, before I introduce you to uh, the excellent panel that we've got lined up for you today, just a, a few quick words of uh, introduction. We'll be uh, looking at uh, questions uh, on the chat as we go along. I'll try and introduce those into the session, uh, but otherwise we'll have a Q&A at the end. So please do, do stay tuned uh, right to the end uh, if you want to hear your, your questions uh, dealt with. Uh, I think uh, everyone will agree this has been a pretty extraordinary uh, 12 months, uh, but in our sector, the uh, commodity trader failures and associated financing losses that rocked the market in 2019 and 2020 uh, were in some ways not particularly remarkable. If you look at the root causes of those failures, though uh, COVID and the drop in oil prices clearly take a lot of the blame uh, for some of those. Uh, and uh, many of the individual lessons learned might uh, be said to be lessons relearned from uh, earlier occasions. Perhaps the more startling statistic is the number of the world's largest trade finance banks that found themselves uh, amidst a market exposure to just a handful of distressed commodity traders to the tune of around $5 billion. Uh, there's been quite a lot of soul searching uh, on the over-reliance placed on balance sheets and certain other factors that led to uh, those losses. Uh, and they've fed into the, uh, the, the topic that we're gonna discuss today. Uh, you might have thought that the shock of that uh, realization would send banks to press the reset button. However, if you look at the uh, oversubscribed uh, $720 million revolving credit facility from Mercuria that was launched less than six months after the Hillyong uh, he collapse, uh, and which closed in November 2020, uh, and that was uh, followed by some 22 banks, that tends to point to a different conclusion being drawn at least for those traders who sit at the top table uh, of the market. Uh, it seems the concentration of liquidity in the sector amongst the big beast commodity traders isn't a trend that's about to reverse anytime soon uh, and continues a withdrawal process of the major banks from the SME trade finance sector uh, that had actually begun following the original Baal II Accord and accelerated by the 2008 financial crisis. And it's a trend that leaves the SME sector increasingly exposed. The opening up of the trade finance sector to a broader pool of financiers and investors uh, became a necessity for them. And indeed for some of the larger players uh, looking to diversify their source of funds. But what do banks and non-bank -bank financiers make of what's happened uh, during 2020? And are traders having to package trade as a product differently to attract the funding. Uh, that's one of the questions that we'll be asking our panel. Um, and I'm gonna also see whether banks have lost the appetite for financing physical inventory uh, and ask how funds and alt financiers get themselves comfortable following uh, the 2020 uh, uh, market scares. Will digitization help make it easier for those financiers to take up the slack? We've assembled a panel which uh, sees the trade and commodity finance world from all angles. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at them to answer and debate some of these questions. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, the panel, who hopefully you'll see uh, up on the screen in front of you now. Uh, Jose Lopez uh, Matias Pena, who's the Managing Director, Head of Trade Solutions and Advisory uh, UAE for First Abu Dhabi Bank. Welcome, Jose. Uh, we have uh, John Galani. Uh, Chief Operating Officer of Triteras, uh, currently based in Dubai. Uh, Fiji Varghese, who's the Managing Director, uh, Regional Head of Trade Finance for the Middle East, uh, Credit Agricole. Uh, Natalia Haas, who's the Managing Partner for the Swiss Space, but globally trading Mercator Commodities. Uh, and last but not least, Orhan Gunas, who's the Director, Head of uh, Commodity Trade Finance at Sparebank. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm going to kick off with uh, a question for Natalia. Uh, Natalia, as a trader, you, you would have felt the aftershock of the commodity finance losses uh, in your dealings with uh, lenders. I um, wonder how, if at all, it's changed the questions that they're asking you 
and the way that you approach them and, and how, how has COVID affected how you work with them and with other traders? Hi, morning everyone, or afternoon for those of you in UAE. Um, and thanks Robert for, for your question for getting me the first one on the panel. Um, so shock in terms of COVID, well, we haven't felt in our business. So first of all, I think most of the traders in uh, the audience, fellow traders in the audience would agree with me on that. Um, and that very that helps a lot. So um, it's nice to be talking to the banks in this year and nice to be saying that um, at least in agricultural space, there hasn't been much uh, effect in terms of the way we do business. It's been quite a positive year. So that's a good uh, um, setup to start talking to lenders. At the same time, yes, lenders are more um, very or more interested in what you're doing. So the dialogue has become much more frank. And it's uh, it wasn't all right to say, you know, certain things aren't going well, certain things, you know, there's certain delays in some things. It's, it wasn't all right to voice your concerns on certain contracts. It's, it's okay to do it now. So lenders kind of expect you to... Um, say that something is different, say that something has happened. So if you know more questions are being asked, if you know how to answer questions, that helps. And at the same time, I wouldn't say that COVID has been a large shock uh, to us. And I would say that uh, the negative attitude to SMEs has begun a while ago. I think that has uh, more to do with um, money laundering, with um, other concerns um, than with COVID. So in that sense, I think we were, we were very well prepared for that shock because all the questions that are being asked now, we were sort of, you know, starting to answer them a couple of years ago. So I think, um, you know, for those SME traders that are well positioned to the market, um, it has uh, not affected our business as much. And if, if it has affected us, then uh, in a positive sense. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm quite happy with, you know, seeing, see, seeing banks being more proactive, seeing banks suggesting other alternative models of working together. Um, I think lenders who were targeting SME previously have not withdrawn because they were understanding the model that we were working in. Um, they had different compliance procedures, they had different um, risk procedures already. So quite well geared um, for working with banks in that sense. And um, yeah, no, so, so, so on my side, it's very positive impact of COVID, very um, much more agility, much more openness on the side of banks. Um, withdrawing of big lenders, we haven't felt it much. I think it's more, you know, it's, it's, it's again, banks working in uh, more standard deals, banks working in, uh, working with larger players. So I'm, you know, looking forward to the change to come. And again, I'm, I think the bankers here in the audience have more to say in terms of, um, how, how do you risk these days? Fiji uh, Vagesi, let me, let me just put that uh, over to you. And I, I wonder whether Natalia's experience there, which is sort of business as usual, mirrors the experience that your bank, uh, Credit Agricola, is having in the current market. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the need for greater transparency, and uh, that, that arises partly from the number of the things that happened in Singapore and elsewhere. But are, are you getting that message in, in the Gulf region? Um, yeah, thanks, Robert. Yes, um, uh, I think uh, now the transparency is a big question for the banks. Um, in the region, it is improving, but still the transparency level uh, needs to be much uh, more improved in order for banks to continue providing the credit facilities. Uh, and for which reason we see now that banks are asking more questions on the transactions the facilities that they are financing. Uh, in the region earlier, there was a concept of confidentiality and secrets and need to know only basis. Uh, but that has changed and needs to be changed more for more transparency. Earlier banks were just relying on the undertakings, the clients were giving the information with, and, uh, uh, and giving credit facilities. And we've seen on back of that quite a bit of frauds and defaults happening uh, in the region here. Um, on the, and to aggravate it more, uh, it is becoming more difficult for bankers now to rely on audited financials, uh, for even, from the, even from the big four, as we are seeing now that trade finance facilities uh, or, or products are used as a good window dressing uh, practices, especially on the receivable discounting structures, which is put in a big way as off-balance sheet. 
and not enabling banks to really gauge the total indebtedness of the counterparty. A good example is the NMC case, uh, which uh, the, 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 they had huge uh, receivables taken off balance sheet and did not really show the full indebtedness of the, the counterparty and, uh, and, and banks were comfortable with the numbers they were seeing on balance sheet. So, the, so to summarize, yes, the due diligence process from banks is more stringent, more questions are asked on the underlying trade, the trade cycle, the buyer, the tenor, to understand are we overfinancing the tenor, are we financing the working capital deficiencies, the usage of funds, the intergroup fundings, uh, the basic questions in banking, but little more stringent even to the big corporates who are not very uh, agreeable, amicable to answer those questions. And these um, questions help in, in, in the bank's better understanding of the underlying risk uh, and assessment of the risk and also in providing of the facility. So uh, it is a give and take from both the ends. And we are seeing, uh, to answer your earlier question, of a drastic um, uh, improvement in those uh, transparency from the corporate clients. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, John Galani, uh, look, Tre Tre Terras, I know, is looking to help plug some of that financing gap that we heard Natalia uh, 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 referring to in, in terms of the SME market at large, although it's not affecting uh, uh, her directly. How does your solution assist those who would fall outside what you might call the Premier League of top traders with those oversubscribed uh, RCFs? Uh, indeed, uh, thank you. Uh, by the way, I, I'm based in London, uh, but oh, um, right. in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, of the answer, I will refer to the uh, uh, to Natalia and Fiji's uh, own answers first. Uh, a lot more questions, um, and that's to be expected, uh, especially when you have an event that is very difficult to capture in in financial in audited accounts. Because by the time you capture that, frankly, your audited accounts are stale. Um, and so what you're having is a dichotomy of more information, more up-to-date information, and yet that increases the cost and, uh, and the compliance um, and the credit analysis and makes it even more difficult for SMEs not so much to answer these questions, that's one of the uh, potential problems, but also from a break-even perspective from a bank to make any such relationship viable. And so the bank is caught in a trap whereby it's looking at, at risks, it's trying to analyze this, it is required to do so, and yet the tools are not there to do so efficiently at the mid-market and, and below. And so what you have, as you mentioned, is a flight to quality. It's not so much that it's a, a quality issue, it's more that you can get these informations quicker and you can rely on this information even if you don't have all the answers. Um, I remember as a, as a child, the saying was, you'll never get fired for buying IBM uh, in the 1980s. Um, and so what you have is you have a whole sector of the market in the SME space, where, uh, which is progressively being abandoned. And that issue is a lot more prevalent in Asia because of the culture, which is uh, uh, of lack of transparency, um, but also because, let's face it, the funders are, to be honest, most of them European whether the French, the Swiss, the Dutch uh, banks. And so you are asking these banks to finance Asian risks, Asian suppliers, Asian uh, end users, Asian traders, and the uh, sovereign risk to, that goes with it, and the foreign currency risk because uh, that goes with it as well. Now, what do we do about it? Uh, we came from a, um, from a principal background in commodity trading, and we saw that over the last couple of years. Uh, it's not new, but it has accelerated. And the whole point is once you leave these banking channels, how do you um, uh, um, put a structure that uh, enables the funders and the borrowers to build a quick, simple, smooth structure that identifies the key information pieces in terms of KYC, AML, and credit risk. And of course, the credit risk is both the accounts and the transactions. So our platform is there in terms of flow processes of all the information that can be digitized and is available uh, through various means. So that is what we're focusing on. And, and, and to what extent do you, does, does what you provide 
tackle that transparency issue, which you, 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 you've heard spoken about already today. Uh, and, and clearly it was one of the concerns that arose out of some of the issues uh, out, in, out in Singapore. We know that, that, that some steps have been taken there with the, 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 the digital in, in inventory uh, register to, to try and tackle that. Do you see that as the way forward uh, globally, or do you see a, a, a broader uh, um, uh, reconnection between banks uh, to prevent uh, uh, too little being known by too few? So clearly information is, is becoming more transparent. And by the way, all these major losses are not from the SME space, just to be clear. Uh, they are from larger corporates. They might not be the ABCDs, but they were all considered very large corporates. So um, in terms of information, there's no doubt we're going into one direction. The idea for our platform is that when the funder comes on the platform to look at the transactions, the information is already there. So there's a pre-qualification. Even funders that come onto our platform have to be KYC, then they are meld. Um, uh, but certainly the traders do. The information is there. The financials are there. Uh, we are building metrics to, to review the financials. Some funders have asked us to be able to plug into their credit model, uh, the financial information, so that they already have the key elements of decision-making in place uh, before they start looking at a particular risk. So this is going to, this is happening currently. Now you've asked me the difference between a bank and a fund. The reality is the reason the funds are doing this is that because there's yield. Um, whereas there's no real yield uh, on the MNCs. And so that, that is where the, 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 the banks are having real problems. If there was yield, they wouldn't really bother. But there is yield in the mid-market. And so currently, in fact, I just jumped off a call with a very large Asian bank looking um, to come back into, quote unquote, the game, um, but through digitization um, and to try and understand how to get back to it, to, to reconnect to its clients. Now, most banks do that in a bit of a shotgun way because they are not certain what is going to work. So they tie as many possibilities um, as, as possible, regardless of which bank is successful and which product is successful, underlying company backing that product, being us or somebody else. The writing is on the wall. Digitization, information flow is key and critical to all, uh, all participants. And be it a bank or a fund, it's the same issue. And we will get there eventually, including the Singapore initiative. Well, John, I might come back to you a little bit later on the question of, of the standardization of the packaging of products and how that helps bring people back in. But, but Jose, if I can just come over to you for a moment. Uh, and switching back to the, to the regional bank focus. Um, are there any particular issues that you see stifling liquidity in the region? And, and what are you saying to regional traders and SMEs who are feeling that credit squeeze? Uh, is it a problem that banks can solve on their own? Uh, is it something that, to be done in partnership uh, with, with others uh, in the non-bank sector? Uh, look, my, my views over here is that um, uh, Banks will not uh, be able to resolve this on, on their own, of course, because okay, so there is uh, what we have already talked about, uh, transparency, and how can banks get the right information at the right time to make sure that they can process the, the transaction. But um, if, if there is one thing that I believe it is um, uh, stopping liquidity, specifically on the commodity um, trade finance sector, it is that um, for, for a few years, uh, banks have been relying on the financial statements of the companies in order to grant certain transactions. And I want to build on, on what Fiji was mentioning before. Okay, I think that uh, banks do have more questions about the trades, more questions about how can the bank take um, uh, security over stocks? How can the bank take uh, assignment over the receivables? How can the bank uh, effectively be financing the transaction end to end? Okay, a few years ago, uh, banks would basically give uh, some sort of uh, an LC plus an import loan transaction uh, for financing a transaction until the client would uh, receive payment from their customer. In today's world, and after having had uh, several hiccups, okay, you need to, to learn to make sure that your transaction is, is funded end-to-end, -end, uh, taking control of the different assets that at different stages of the transaction uh, will be created. So by the time that you disburse money, uh, so your client can purchase whatever they are purchasing from the supplier, 
you have already a structure how you're going to be receiving the payment from, from the end customer. And, and I believe that uh, from an SME perspective, specifically in this region, okay, um, these um, this, uh, uh, types of structures, okay, and, and we are probably not talking about anything new, but these kind of structures is, are, are the structures that banks are using right now just to make sure that um, uh, the, um, the uh, bank investments of those uh, financings are effectively settled. Yeah, and I, 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 in terms of uh, of what you're saying to your trading customers, are, are, are people receptive uh, uh, to that to the to the to the to the information flow that you're looking for? Uh, look, um, there are, there are certain companies that um, they have been uh, managing their their financings uh, historically in one way, and and uh, some of these may may look like a change. Uh, what we want to do as a bank is effectively to those clients of the bank where we have uh, trust, where we have been banking them for a while, we want to give them time to readjust their commercial uh, relationships with their customers so these uh, financing structures can be set up. Okay, um, Some of the times uh, when the risk is too high, uh, we might not be in a position to keep a lot of time. Okay, But, but essentially, we want to keep on financing our clients. Uh, we are not... Uh, uh, pulling back uh, uh, on the commodity trade finance angle, but we need to make sure that we set up structures that are going to be um, sustainable, okay? So it's not that we're going to have a, a hiccup uh, two, three, four months down the road. Or, or hang, can I uh, just come over to you? Uh, it, it sounds like improved information flow, whether that's delivered through digital innovation or, or, or not, is, is gonna be an absolute given for, for lenders of all types going forward. But do you see technology replacing what I would call old-fashioned due diligence? Obviously, uh, no one can get on a plane and go and look at the projects these days. But what's the role of the global rather than regional bank in commodities in the future? And do you see that balance sh shifting in, a, in, a, in, a, in any meaningful way? Thanks. Thanks, Robert. I think uh, this is a very good question, and it's very hard to answer as well. But in general, what has been discussed so far, uh, I would like to give a little bit like positive view about the banking industry and the risk appetite on the banks, especially on our size of uh, banks who is uh, very strong in the, in the region of uh, Russia, CIS, Black Sea, Mediterranean and Baltic Sea. And we are growing our reach over 20 countries. What we try to do is like we are heavily investing in digitization. And I think in last one year, I mean, I was in this conference last year as well. And I think we have seen a huge improvement in our industry in, ter in terms of acceptance and acknowledgement of industrial development from digital signatures, digitized signatures to uh, platforms, which is uh, like evolutionary rather than revolutionary in our uh, common trade finance space. But this enabler is quite overarching and uh, what, what we can do uh, in the next decade will be quite substantial, like step by step. Most of these, um, let's say, evolutionary changes are not happening yet, but we are seeing just hints of them. But slowly we are going to uh, come to those uh, innovations applicable in our industry. Um, I think like digital trackers of cargoes, uh, distributed um, like ledger uh, technology on quick and immutable transactional lending solutions and online lending solutions. And one of the major ones uh, offering a lot of solutions is in this, in this panel. And I think uh, banks will follow uh, those uh, developments step by step. But uh, the concrete developments that we see at the moment is we can um, we can control transactions from an office in, in in somewhere in the world much better than before. If you have cargoes like more than hundreds of vessels around the world or um, like dozens of places on the ports. So, um, how quick this technology will kick and shape the commodity trade finance industry? For sure, it's going to take time, uh, and we are we should be. Critical, I mean, critical thinking should prevail uh, on this process, but I think this is highly needed in our industry and it, it, it's going to come. I mean, one of the topics that, that was uh, tapped into was confidentiality and secrecy that needs to switch in our industry uh, towards more transparency. We, we believe in this, uh, and I think more collaboration between the lenders, uh, alternative lenders, banks and the stakeholders, as well as uh, trading companies in the industry, 
should collaborate and make it more transparent in between uh, to, um, to, to make our industry uh, much more efficient. This massive collaboration effort will require integrated uh, technology solutions uh, adopted by uh, each uh, stakeholder as well. Um, but these uh, customized tech solutions will step by step uh, will be solve uh, the, these issues. One of the questions actually I've seen coming up on on, on the chat, and, and it's really echoing a theme that we've 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 heard a little bit earlier, but is 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 whether you see some sort of common platform uh, for 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 trade instruments for 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 receivables for cargoes. Do you see that as as a uh, uh, as 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 a, a breakthrough that that will happen uh, soon, or are we some distance off that? Obviously, there are banking secrecy, any number of issues to be broken down to uh, uh, to, to to change the way that we all work. I think it's it's going to change um, the way we work, but the cooperation uh, between all these uh, stakeholders are not at uh, at the best level yet i mean we, we didn't come to that stage yet but what is critical is um, there are different solutions for lc um, and documentary credits as well as discounting of receivables on on other products i think we see different solutions as well as a bunch of uh, balance, balance sheet lending for smaller entities or discounting of uh, invoices. I think uh, the market will consolidate itself uh, in, in time. And I believe like banks will not be out of this process at all. Banks are uh, have quite big muscles to, to bring liquidity and technology. And it, it's going to accelerate the tech in this regard with cooperation, I believe. Thank, thanks very much, Orhan. Natalia, just coming back to you on the on the trader side, having heard uh, the, the the bankers' expectations of what the, uh, the the brave new world of commodity and trade finance looks like, what do you see as your own investment priorities in terms of technology, to the extent that you haven't already made those investments, and how big a difference do you expect those investments to make in terms of you being able to access? not only your traditional lines of funding, but other, other forms of funding uh, from, from non-bankers, for example, in, in the future? Um, well, I very much like the comments by Oren uh, about evolution or revolution, because we have seen a lot of evolutionary changes in um, the past year. So all the technology that we already used, we've started to use much more extensively, we've started to adopt different practices towards uh, the remote mode of working. The real sort of disruptive revolution, the real disruptive technological change is yet to come. So it's very much, very nice to see the appetite for green investments. It's very nice to see appetite for digital data and digital monitoring from the banks, because that's the first step. Um, I've been busy with digitalization for the past sort of five, seven years. And uh, you, sort of, um, you, you need to be there. You need to be at the client's facility. You need to actually see um, how can you gather the data that is going to be useful for the bank. And then you need to be able to sell it. And it was very difficult to sell that kind of data in the past years because um, there are platforms able, which are catered for, for the data from the facility. So you can you know, measure the moisture level in the silos, you can measure the volumes in the silos, you can monitor it all digitally, you can have um, a reliable transfer of data uh, towards your trader, towards your bank. Um, but the first question that um, the suppliers ask, so the first questions that you get asked in the facilities is sort of what kind of sensor do I install? Where do, do I get the electricity from? Where, you know, very, very, very basic things. And you really need to be there to install it. We were not able to do that in the past year. So it's good that um, it's been realized. So the need for better monitoring, the need for more grassroots approach is being realized and it suits the interest of all of us because first of all um, there's more margin at the grassroots so there's more margin in the um, production and you know the, if the banks are willing to go that direction there's more money to burn for all of us um, that's for one for another there's more transparency so more data if, if we can gather more data at the facilities then um of course, we can know more about um, where the goods are coming from, what sort of quality and conditions that allows us to be more prepared for any hiccups that can occur um, throughout the deliveries. 
And I feel there's a lot of need for that really at the production sites, really on the fields, um, you know, sort of going into that direction because uh, container deliveries, loading uh, ports are all very digitalized. So it's very common to accept scanned copies of documents. It's very common to um, store the goods at the port facilities and get some inventory finance for that. So what I really sense from the banks is, um, you know, you get asked more questions, you answer them. And what I really sense from the banks is the appetite to um, really understand the business model and go more into what's the, um, you know, deep in the supply chain. So that's very nice. That's very good. And I think there are many um, trials, there are many alternatives that we can um, explore in that respect. Um, but for the moment, in the past year, we have really started to use other technologies more extensively, not, not the technologies that can really help us to develop the industry further, but again, digital signatures, you know, very basic stuff, um, digital signatures, um, I don't know, WhatsApp monitoring of silos, and those thing, thing, things that, you know, we could use before, but um, weren't using uh, due to the lack of needs for it. So evolution, revolution, the real revolution is uh, being felt, being developed, and it's very nice to see um, more financiers, more lenders coming in that field. Thanks very much, Dee. Jose, just uh, come back. One of the questions I know that, that I've seen popping up on the on the chat and and, and uh, that uh, we've spoken about before, problems such as um, double financing of goods and receivables, uh, to a large extent, feed off that lack of transparency and lack of communication. Is is is, is that a particular issue that you've seen in the region? Uh, and you know, what what do you see as the solution for that? Uh, look, my um, my particular view is that um, this is not a specific for the region. This is uh, global. Okay, you can ask uh, a few years ago to certain banks in Qingdao or in Singapore last year, or in Europe in 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 uh, in other times. So um, double financing is is an inherent risk in trade finance, and um, this is perhaps um, why banks are being a little bit more stringent. So. Um, if if um, if the financials effectively just represent a, a picture, a picture at a certain date, and I recall um, having a funny conversation with uh, with a client long time ago, that um, when I asked them about their financial statements, they said, "Which which one do you want? 31st of December or 15th of January?" And I said, "Look, just just give me both, so I can understand what the difference is." But um, but uh, in in a world in which the financials um, are no longer that representative, okay, um, uh, double financing becomes a problem because risks that you thought that you would be taking against the financial strength of a company, well, maybe that financial strength, it is just a, a picture, okay? But in the real world, the company is not that strong. And this is why banks tend to uh, have a little bit more appetite and, and push clients to get into uh, perfected structures where the assets are being assigned to the bank, whichever the assets are. Um, what is the solution? Look, um, I, I guess that the whole market is uh, trying to bring a solution over here. Uh, probably the solution is a combination of technology, is a combination of um, uh, the different uh, participants in the market to understand um, that, that banks as investors have certain credit appetite, okay? And uh, if the transactions do not meet that credit appetite, are not going to happen. And um, uh, finally, I'd say it is also a, a matter of, um, from a legal perspective, getting control of, of the different assets. Um, I would say one, one of the impediments perhaps is that today we have, um, um, I don't know how many different platforms, probably more than 200 platforms uh, globally. Um, every time that you have most of the participants on a transaction in one single platform, probably that is very easy. Uh, to do and very easy to see and the benefit is very tangible. But when you have 200 clients in 200 clients that are using 200 different platforms, then it becomes a burden. So uh, to the previous question that, that you were putting, is, is this going to converge? Oh, probably in the future it will. Okay. Um, but, but the reality is that until that happens, uh, I guess that um, uh, banks will keep on applying um, stringent methods of assessing risk. Okay. And at the same time, uh, participants will need to collaborate to make their transactions uh, financial. Uh, uh, Orhan, can I just go over to you? Thank you very much, Jose. Orhan, on a global level, do, do you agree uh, with what Jose said? It's, it's, it's a global issue. And the th one of the things that always interests me about who takes the lead in, in terms of bringing innovation in is, is, this a, is it going to be bank-led or uh, is it going to be led by... Uh, traders 
uh, in terms of that convergence, uh, you know, moving from, as you say, from 200 different platforms to a, to a, to a manageable uh, number that, that actually give people that transparency and, 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 and reach into, uh, into the market? Another tough question, uh, Robert. Uh, I mean, first of all, I agree with uh, Jose on um, on his points, and especially agreeing with his client about uh, his approach to the financials. I think that's that's what we see in the market. But um, two things. First of all, uh, banks and the lenders needs to uh, focus on their forte, and there is no catch-all policy for anyone. And being global and local is a very, very difficult job. And strategic niche of the banks should be protected. And the, uh, the strategic niche can be on the product and geography or both of them. And uh, the fortes of each institution uh, should be underlined and, and, and it should be very visible in the eyes of the clients. And the efficiency comes from, I think, transactional lending and focusing on the transactions and trade rather than focusing on lending and banking. Because in the history of commodity trade finance, especially in commodity trade finance, what we have seen, bankers were in the trade at the, at the inception of the business and two or three decades ago. In time, bankers started to focus on only lending activities. But I think that there has been a distance between the trade itself, actual trade, and the banking practices. And... I think we need to do the trades together with the clients as close as possible. When it comes to quality of due diligence and where the innovation will come, I think uh, the best approach is, this is a unilateral process. This is not a, a, sorry, multilateral process, not a unilateral process. So I think all the participants in the industry for the sake of improvement and innovation needs to put uh, their input. And I think the whole industry will, will be pushed forward uh, in this way. And I think, of course, the banks will have, uh, and, and the large lenders will have a lot of uh, power to, um, to move the uh, innovation in the industry. But I think everyone needs each other. It's a cooperation. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, uh, you, can, I, can I just come back to you for a, for a moment? Uh, I'm wondering where you see the, the, the pinch points in the trade finance market during the next six months to a year. We've, we, we've seen Dubai try to ride out the COVID storm with its tourist sector, which has kept going, but there may be some trouble ahead there. How are you preparing for it in, in, in the region? Uh, uh, speaking mainly for the region, I think one of the pinch points for TF in the market would be more sectorial. Um, especially for us to be in the contracting, um, aviation, um, retail, mainly on the discretionary spending side and also automotive. Uh, uh, we have seen a few major defaults in the contracting sector in a big way. And uh, banks are very cautious on this sector in the region uh, for any trade banker, uh, uh, not a commodity trade banker, a vanilla trade banker guarantees is a major portion of his portfolio. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of unfair calling on the guarantees. Uh, so uh, banks are very cautious uh, uh, on this segment. And also other thing we're seeing is now we're starting to see the uh, 2020 <clears throat> balance sheets coming in. Uh, we see a bit of deterioration in the credit uh, positions. We see uh, receivables uh, getting delayed, bulking up. Uh, uh, this is destabilizing the working capital and the cash flow requirements of the counterparties. Uh, so I think the biggest focus for us is on, on, on the credit risk, understanding the requirements and the clients. Um, um, and major trouble, as you asked for us, uh, it, this was again a bit uh, touched upon by John, is that in the region now, uh, or I can say more of the international banks, uh, there is a flight to quality. And uh, with, with the flight to quality on the risk, there is a big of a concentration risk on the large entities and government related entities. And this in turn is squeezing out uh, the small and the mid cap uh, uh, of, of getting facilities and which is a backbone to any economy. Uh, and that can be a tripling effect that can go upwards to this large entities. Uh, so we see this uh, unplucking or, or pulling of the carpets uh, under the feed from, by the banks um, for, from this segment uh, is uh, alarming. Uh, um, 
again, uh, it depends on the uh, strategy and the risk and the commercial strategy of big each bank's what is the target market they want to be. Uh, but we see that uh, that is hurting the, the regions. Vijay, thanks very much. John, just coming back to you briefly, we've, we've got a few minutes left. Um, you know, despite the uh, you know, p potentially tricky time that lies ahead, are you expecting that the combination of, of, of increased comfort uh, with risk through, through the, the, uh, the, the innovations which you're able to bring to, uh, to, to get information out there and that higher yield, which we spoke about a little bit earlier, are going to continue to attract more non-bank lenders to the market to fill that, uh, the, the, the gap that we know that is, is appearing? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, we are seeing a huge appetite uh, from non-traditional lenders, non-bank lenders for yield. Uh, to be perfectly frank, it's not so much that they are interested in trade finance per se. They are interested in the yield. And the way that they are interested is to understand the risk-reward relationship. And that's where things go wrong. Because when they see the yield, the next question is, what's the risk? And if the financials are too old, therefore too stale, you cannot, they cannot assign a credit rating. So that is, that is huge appetite. I mean, there are literally, we're talking to, uh, to, to funds that have, uh, you know, huge high powder. We're talking about tens of billions. Um, uh, but that equation, how you funnel it, uh, how you summarize succinctly what a transaction means, what it is from end to end in terms of risk in, and the hooks in terms of recovery, whether it's a digitized uh, repository of information or others, that's really critical. So do we see this going? Absolutely. But I think we are all on the same wavelength. A, we need SMEs for emerging markets. If you don't have SMEs in emerging markets, the emerging markets will not emerge. Um, you need new companies, new ideas, uh, and so forth. So SMEs are critical to emerging markets. There is yield. How you connect the two is critical and that only can happen with digitization. For the next six to 12 months, we see this uh, as a first step into many, many steps that funders are taking, uh, whether it's banks longer term that are uh, reconfiguring or shorter term the funds. But I want to leave everyone with the, the following idea. If you looked at, um, at mortgages 50 years ago, our parents would go in a suit and tie to their local banker um, that they have met many, many times and tried to do a, a, a deal. Um, today, we do not see our bankers. Uh, we might have somebody that physically comes into the, into the building to inspect the building, but that's it. Same thing with credit cards. So there are ways for information to hook onto the risk, this, uh, uh, the, the risk analysis portion that allows for transactions to be standardized. And, um, and that is not, there's not one silver bullet, it's many, and all of us are trying to figure this out. Uh, funds are very, very driven um, to figure this out as well, and I, I strongly believe that they will be players for the future. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, COVID has been a miserable thing globally for, for everyone, and, and uh, obviously brought untold misery across uh, uh, many, many parts of the world. Uh, in terms of the way it's made us do business, I'm going to ask you all br briefly before we finish in a, in, a, in a few words to sum up what, is, what have we learnt that is positive that's going to help us uh, in the way that we go forward and do business. So start with you, Natalia. Um, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that question, but just give me a second to think. What have we learnt? We can survive through this as well. So I said, well, I've learned that, you know, instead of spending eight months a year traveling, I can <laughs> sit in my house and still get things done. So I think uh, I think we've learned how resilient we are, really, as an industry. You know, being in the volatile market, we've learned that um, it's, it can actually be stable when the rest of the world is volatile. Jose, same question to you. I would say that uh, we have realized how lucky we are that we're in the 21st century and we have technology helping us because otherwise, uh, if this would have happened 
a hundred years ago, the um, economy would have uh, really collapsed. Whilst uh, I'm not saying that it hasn't, but um, obviously between 10 and 20 percent reduction in GDP in the in the worst affected countries uh, doesn't look like um, something that you will die for. So um, I think that we are very, very lucky. Fiji, same one to you. Yeah, for, for me, I mean, I would speak from a credit perspective. Uh, what we learned is uh, it, you know, we, the corporates we thought were too big to fail with heavy cash flows. Uh, and with uh, deep pockets from the owners. And when, when, when situations go bad, we, we realize that's not the situation. Now uh, we need to dig deeper uh, when really things go bad. It's not what we perceive from the balance sheet and what we perceive from the uh, things the CFOs were telling us. John, quick word from you and then last from Mohan. Where there is money to be made, there's money to be shared. And uh, uh, people have found ways to continue doing business using technology uh, for their own purposes, because we all need to eat. Uh, products still need to be produced. And so technology has been this enabler that, as Jose said, has really saved our bacon. It's not the only one. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, banks pumping in money is, uh, is not the, the, the big one. Um, but there are solutions to problems we've never thought we would uh, face. Uh, and solutions we, we had to accept very quickly. Okay, Orhan, last word from you before we close. Sure, like I think two things. One is uh, about the massive resilience we learned and we have shown uh, in this process because I think that is uh, across the whole industry, uh, stakeholders, and the second is in such despair and crisis, always technology uh, flourished. I think innovation and technology is, is, is flourishing and we are going to see this. Um, I mean, this is not going to be an exception, but it's going to be much bigger in, in, in the coming uh, years. And seeing this and witnessing this is also part of our experience, I think. Right. And I found out how to pair my AirPods this morning. And that's <laughs> been my, one of my, my great achievements of, of, of the day. Thank you to our panel. Thanks very much for tuning in. You'll be able to catch up on this later if you missed any of it. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you to all of you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.